But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is this, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the, the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from punishment. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Mm -hmm. God bless this reading of our holy word. So that's the end of the story. Nora just finished out the book of Jonah. It has no conclusion. It leaves us wondering what Jonah might say or how Jonah might respond. But what we do know is it is a reading filled with anger. Over this last month of mental health awareness, we've been talking about the stages of grief. And anger is one of those phases that we go through. In our story today, Jonah starts out angry that God is not going to destroy Nineveh. Now, Jonah's still holding out for hope that the wrath of God might still come. He ends up angry about a bush that comes up over him while he's sitting on the hillside to see what happens. A bush that goes away in just a couple of verses. But I'm left wondering what Jonah's really angry about. How often have we asked ourselves the same question? We're talking to someone and then our emotions just come out sideways. We're upset about something, but our actions are kind of over the top, right? We're sure that we're justified in our anger. We're just not sure why we can't control the volume of it. How often have we been upset with a loved one's words? but expressed our feelings to the driver in front of us? How often have we been angry about something on the news, but taking it out on the neighbor's cat? How often have we been truly outraged by an injustice along with our friend's squeaky voice? Do they not know how they sound when they whine? Or that ball game, can you imagine making that call in that situation? Haven't we ever played this game before? And the price of milk, have you seen what they're charging for groceries these days? Can you believe it? Jonah's story is probably similar to ours. He didn't just start stewing over Nineveh in the midst of this story. 
three chapters back, back in chapter one, God sends Jonah to Nineveh to send them, sends him there to tell them to change their ways. Jonah gets a sh on a ship going the opposite direction. He's clearly already got beef with Nineveh. Jonah's ship gets caught in a storm. He gets tossed overboard because he identifies that he's the reason for the storm. A huge fish swallows him up, takes Jonah, and spits him up on the shore, conveniently on the way to Nineveh. As much as I would never like to imagine being swallowed by a large fish, covered by whatever intestinal stuff is in there, I would love at some point when I'm going the wrong direction in life for God just to pick me up and dump me where I'm supposed to go. In that case, I do have some jealousy of Jonah. But his desire to avoid going to Nineveh suggests this beef's old. Whatever he has between him and Nineveh, it's been going on a while. Just having God stay up in his business was probably an irritating part of the story for Jonah. But we know his hurt, his anger towards Nineveh is older. It clearly goes way back. We can tell by the way he speaks to them now that he's there and all, he figures he might as well do what God's told him. Nineveh is a big city, scripture tells us, a three days walk across, bigger than Covina. Jonah walks one day and delivers one line of, of, of prophecy. This is it. The only line of prophecy in the entire book of Jonah. How we characterize it as a prophet and not a parable, I don't know. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. How he missed the opportunity to say, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be no more. I don't know why. It would have been much more intimidating. But that's it. No flowery poetic talk. No message about God's greatness, power, and love. Really no conviction in this. He doesn't have a lot of investment in the prophecy and the warning he has given. Jonah has a real problem with Nineveh and an even bigger problem with God forgiving them. Jonah does not want them to repent. He wants the wrath of God to pour down on them. We don't have a backstory. Lucas and Spielberg have not devised a prequel to show us how this happened in three films or less. But we can look at Israel's history and get some ideas. We can make some assumptions. But at the core, anger is a personal thing. It's a personal thing. And it's often tied directly to grief. Right there with denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, anger is a very natural phase. It's not something we necessarily have to be ashamed of. And remember, these things aren't always a straight line. Anger can come up out of the loss of a relationship, what they said or didn't say what they did or didn't do, what we said or didn't do. We can be mad at them or at ourselves. Anger can come up over the loss of a job after an accident. If something should be grieved, at some point we will probably experience some anger. Anger, of course, also comes up like all grief around the loss of a life. Anger with those who should have paid more attention to them, given them better care. Anger that we did not get more time with one we loved. Anger that we did not resolve what we wanted to while we had the opportunity. Anger with ourselves and others. Anger is an emotional experience. It doesn't have to be logical. And if it's not logical, we know from brain science, that means it also has no timeline. Anger comes when it wants to, not when it makes sense. But anger does have to have its moment. It's time. You can't push anger away and think it won't come back. Now, anger can also be very useful. Anger can move us to take action, to make personal changes. It can move us. It moves us. When we are stuck in grief and can't move from one phase to another, can't get on with life, anger can be that fuel that fires us and sends us into something different. When we're stuck in our own head, trapped by habits or indecision, anger can move us. But we have to be careful. 
Anger can also move us to do a lot of damage to ourselves and to others. Just look at Jonah. He's sitting on the hillside hoping God will destroy an entire city. Who does that? Except if you listen and read some of our social media. He's sitting on a hillside waiting on the wrath of God to begin. Who does that? Unless you listen to a lot of sermons on YouTube. And then, eh. He's wound tightly. Jonah is a powder keg ready to explode. And the shade of a big bush coming and going triggers his anger towards God. Now, this is one of the reasons that therapists love the book of Job. Doesn't matter if you're Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, non, none, done, wherever you are with religion. Therapists love this book because it's a great story of response, how we wrestle with it. Jonah's feelings are all out there for us to see. There's no hiding them, which is healthy. But God's response, God is the master therapist. God asks in response, is your anger a good thing? What a great question. Is your anger a good thing? Jonah's response without hesitation is, yes, it's a good thing, even to death. Which suggests it's not a good thing. If, if we're more tied to our anger than we are our life, we may need to revisit our anger, right? But God's question, is your anger a good thing? What about us? What is fueling our anger? The injustice that we keep crying out over? The secret hurts we keep burying deeper and deeper? The obvious isms that others keep denying? Is our anger over those things a good thing? What's fueling our anger? Is it the loss of a loved one that we weren't ready to let go of? Is it a loss of life around us that seems avoidable? Is it the loss of our own normal as we deal with a constantly changing world and the people that we come in and out of relationship with? Is our anger a good thing? Has it been helpful for us? What is fueling our anger? What has God done? What has God not done that's made us angry? Are we like Jonah, mad at God for not being as angry as we are about the things around us? Are we mad at God for being gracious? Are we mad at God for loving those we can't? Are we mad at God for forgiving? Have you ever found yourself mad at God for forgiving you? What's fueling our anger? And is it a good thing? If we look back at the work of Gandhi, he took the work of anger and made a spectacle and spiritual exercise out of it in the March to the Sea. Our own American civil rights movement was forged and successful out of anger, indignance that was spiritually directed. But it also took the anger of others who did not want change and allowed it to add fuel to the fire. It took the anger of others and redirected it into the public spotlight. Wherever our anger is coming from, we need to remember that it's natural. If we ask, is our anger a good thing? And the answer is no, that doesn't make the anger any less natural. Of course we feel that. There are reasons in our world to be angry. We just have to find ways to do it, ways to express it, ways to share it. We have to face it so that it doesn't control us. We shared some quotes in our Thursday night 
Zoom chat about anger this last week. And one of them is that anger leads you to give the greatest speech you'll ever regret. <laughs> Can we understand our anger? Can we ride that anger like a wave towards change? Will anger at the way we have behaved lead us to hurt ourselves and act inwardly or to get help? to change our habits and behaviors, to address relationships in new ways, to make bold life decisions? Can we ride that anger of the way people have been unloved, mistreated, abused, and marginalized as a way to motivate us, to fill us, to love out loud to the extremes? Wherever our anger is coming from, it is natural, Wherever our anger is coming from, we know God is with us as we face it. And wherever our anger is coming from, how might it guide us? How might it lead us, motivate us for whatever God is going to do next? Thank you.